Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining us this Sunday evening for our uh, Old Testament studies continuing in the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 29. If you've got your Bible, read along with me. Uh, I'm going to skim through this chapter. There's a lot of details about the procedures for the priesthood and their clothing and all that, and you can uh, read that detail later on if you want to think there's about 40 verses of it. But we'll skip through and hit some of the high parts here. Let's start with 29 verse 1. We were talking about uh, Aaron and his sons being called by God. It wasn't their choice. God said, you're going to be the priest in this tabernacle that they're building to make the sacrifices. So here we continue in that thought. This is the thing, 29.1, this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them or to make them holy. Hallow comes from the word holy, close kin to it. It's getting close to a... Here in America and around the world, I guess, Halloween. And once upon a time, that was a Christian holiday. It was All Hallows' Eve. It was a, or All Saints' Day. It was the day when they recognized the holy people of old, the saints. But uh, not much to do with Christianity and Halloween anymore. But to hallow them means going to make them holy. So how are we going to make somebody holy here? Well, um, there's only one way that really does that. Of course, it's through Christ. You're made holy. You can't become holy yourself, and you can't make somebody else holy. The Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and ever-present companionship is what makes us holy today, our faith in that by grace. So here's what you're going to do, though. Remember, the Old Testament was object lessons or picture lessons to uh, bring us up to speed so, till the fullness of times when people could... Uh, look back over it like us and see how God was bringing us to this New Testament age. Everything was pointing toward the cross in the Old Testament. So to make the priest holy, the ones that are going to minister the sacrifices, to minister me in the priest office, here's what you do. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. Now here's the foundation of this. All you need to know is the only way that the they were going to be made holy so that they could stand before the Lord and minister is they were made holy through the sacrifice. And in order for there to be a sacrifice, an innocent victim died, shed its blood, and they were made holy through that, that sacrifice took their sins upon them. Now, this is all just picture lessons. That couldn't really do it. It had to be a, a sinless human being. That's Jesus. He's, he's coming. He's thousands of years after this, uh, 1,600 years or so, I think, after what we're reading here today. But the priest, uh, the foundation is already that they're going to be made holy to stand before God because of the sacrifice. Let's drop down to verse 5. And we're getting back to those garments that we let, read about last week, the, the priestly robe. They were really beautiful, all the different colors and miter and the breastplates and all this stuff that they were wearing, shoulder pads and all that. Verse 5, you'll take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat, the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and girding with the curious girdle in the ephod, which, by the way, because of the sacrifice, we are dressed in the righteousness of Christ. We're beautiful before God. And you put the mitre on his head, the head headpiece, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. So we're going to have a service to say that, uh, going to pour that oil over his head and anoint him, say, hey, that's symbolic of God has set this person aside for the priesthood, and God has anointed him. The oil and everything that people were doing was symbolic, a picture lesson to show what God had invisibly done. God had anointed them for the priesthood. Bring your sons, they're going to be priests who put coats on them, gird them with girdles, verse 9, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them, the priest office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. Aaron's descendants, his grandkids, great-grands, and on down through history until the New Testament time, they're, they're going to be the Levites. They're going to be the ones that are going to be the, the priest at the tabernacle. Consecrate Aaron and his sons, verse 10, and cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. I think what's happening here is this bullock's about to be killed, but Aaron and their sons, his sons who are going to be priests, they take their hands and they lay upon the head of that bull before it's killed. And symbolically, seeing that saying, like we understand that our sins are being transferred to the sacrifice so that we can come and stand sinless before God. 
Now, that didn't really do it, but that was the picture lesson, see, leading us to Christ. Our sins were transferred to Christ, and he died in our place. He was the innocent victim. And you'll kill the bullock before the Lord, verse 11. By the door of the, congreg of the tabernacle of the congregation, and you'll take the blood of the bullock. See, the Old Testament's full of blood, and the blood of these sacrifices, it was all pointing to the real blood, the most precious blood of all, the the, the blood of the sinless Son of God who's going to die for shed his blood. And you'll put that upon the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament makes um, the point that of all these cleansing ceremonies in the Old Testament to make stuff cleanse symbolically, it involved death and it involved blood being applied to it. And that's all pointing to us. The only thing that makes us clean is Christ died for us. He shed his blood for us. All right, let's go down to uh, verse 33. You can read some of these details later on your own if you'd like. And they shall eat those things wherein the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. They belong to God's people. But uh, they're going to partake in the blessings. This is part of the sacrifices. They'll get to eat of these things the priest would. That's, that's their portion. Remember, they didn't get land. The Levites didn't. There was a tribe that didn't get land because uh, God provided to them through the other of God's people. They'll eat those things where the atonement was made. Atonement is used a lot in the Old Testament, and a good definition of it is that you won't find in Webster's is to divide it up at one with God, the way it's meant to be, at one meant atonement. But atonement means it makes peace between man and God. Uh, interesting place in the Bible that the Hebrew word atonement is used, but it was translated covering in this place, was about the Noah and the ark story. It said that Noah put a covering upon the ark. Remember the Lord took him and showed him and told him to uh, take that, that bitumen, a type of pitch, and after he got the ark built, they would cover the whole outside of it with that pitch. That's what waterproofed it so it would float through the judgment. And it's called a covering there, but it's the very same word over in here that's transfer, translated uh, atonement. And it's by, well, that word atonement's used one time in the New Testament. Romans 5, verse 11. And it's talking about the blood of Christ by which we have the atonement. It's because Christ died for us. Once again, we're saying because Christ died for us, we can float above the judgment, if you would. That the judgment's coming just like it was in Noah's day. It's a different type of judgment at the end this time, but it's a judgment for all of us. But our only hope to survive through the judgment instead of perishing with the rest of the world is if we have the atonement by grace through faith, we believe the story of Jesus Christ's gospel. And that atonement's made. And that'll consecrate and sanctify or set them apart for the service of God. All right, let's drop down to verse 6 here. Excuse me, 36. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin, sin offering for atonement. And cleanse the altar when you've made atonement for it, and you'll anoint it to sanctify it. To, so every day they had to make that sacrifice to go into the tabernacle. The writer of Hebrews, which is the best commentary you will find on the Old Testament, it's a commentary in the Bible itself. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, I think it was Paul wrote it, explains a lot of this stuff under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he makes the point that uh, while they had to offer sacrifices for sin every day, which really didn't even take away sin, it was just picture lessons of the real blood of the God-man who would die and really take away sins. They had to do it every day, but he said when Christ came, he just had to die once. He don't have to die again and again. One time, the real blood was shed, and you're redeemed forever, eternity. So uh, they'd have to do it every day, though. Let's go to verse 37. Uh, seven days you'll make an atonement at, for the altar and sanctify it. Set it aside for the service of God, sanctify, and it'll be an altar most holy. And whatsoever touches the altar will be holy. Have you been to the altar of Calvary? By grace through faith, when you go to Calvary, where Christ died for you, you're made holy. 
All right, let's keep going here. 38. Now, this is that which you will offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you'll offer in the morning, one lamb in the evening. Twice a day you have to offer these lambs even. Uh, you ever stop and wonder when we read through the sacrifices of the Old Testament for uh, 1,600 years, if that number's correct, from Moses' time to the time Christ died on Calvary, actually until the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. when they quit making the sacrifices. Uh, wonder how many total gallons of blood was spilled by these animals. I mean, just read this. Do two of these a day, one of these a day. I mean, it's just constant sacrifices. Blood, just gallons and gallons and gallons of blood. It's like we sing a lot of hymns about the blood, but, you know, we're not singing about the blood of these old animals in the Old Testament. We're singing about the blood of Christ because all those myriads of gallons of blood was speaking to us that the real blood's coming and now that we're on this side of the cross and the real blood's already came and we're made righteous by it. We don't have to bring a goat or a bull or a lamb to church anymore because the real lamb of God has died that takes away the sins of the world. And he was the only one that could. As the writer of Hebrews once again says, the blood of goats and bulls couldn't take away sin. Only Christ could do that. It had to be one of us, see? And verse 40, with one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen, measurements of oil, fourth part of a hen for a drink offering. The other lamb, verse 41, you'll offer at evening and do there according to the meat offering in the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the one hand, a sweet savor of those sacrifices being burnt, you say, well, if that was a, an animal being roasted, well, maybe it's... Uh, Maybe it's a sweet savor to a man, too. It's like a barbecue going on, being roasted, right? Remember, the priests are going to eat part of it. But I think what Moses' pen, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying is that the death of that animal is it's sweet to God because it's pointing toward the death of his son that will take away the sins of the world. The death of his son is not what was sweet to God, but the fact that his son was obedient and was willing to die to redeem all of his lost creation, all that would believe in him. That's, that's a sweet savoring in, in the nostrils of God. 42, this will be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto you. God says that, that building that I'm having you build that we've been reading about all the details and everything is remember I said more than once when we started studying about that tabernacle it's a picture lesson of how a holy God can dwell in the midst of an unclean sinful humanity and there's ways that you can come in contact with God but uh, the way you approach him God says I'll meet with you there now, what we just been reading about? Before you get there, you're making the sacrifice at the brazen altar, and then you get to the door of the tabernacle, and God says, I'll meet with you there. See, God can't meet with you until you've gone through the sacrifice of Calvary first. There's one mediator between man and God, and that's Jesus. That's the only way we can fellowship with God, through what Jesus did for us. And there I'll meet you, verse 43, with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And I will sanctify, God's doing it. See, I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And God says, and I will dwell, another word for live among them. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. He's approachable, but only through the sacrifice. And they'll know that I'm the Lord their God. And that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them, and I am the Lord their God. Now, let me say this before we leave this chapter. We skim through it, but forget about somebody that maybe was a Christian. Maybe they weren't, just pretend Christian. Maybe they were a real Christian, but, you know, Christians are... Or we're sinful people too, just relying on the forgiveness and grace of God. And we make mistakes and we handle things wrong. But, but just forget about who turned you off to the church at some point. Forget about maybe who hurt you and wounded you for a lifetime. It ain't about them. It ain't even about that. It's, a, it's about 
your personal relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And this Bible, it makes sense. If you'll give it a chance, all these things that happened hundreds of years ago are in agreement with bringing us up to the knowledge of Christ. You're on this side of the cross looking back at it. Jesus died for you, and God loves you, and you can approach him through that sacrifice and have fellowship eternally with the living God. We'll see you next week, chapter 30.